What is currently the hardest part about me being blind? Everything. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Hey guys, it's Molly here again, and clearly got Mama B here with me too. Mama B has been in a lot of videos in the past, but not for quite some time. Yes. You're mainly just like the voice from behind the, the camera, yes. like the voice of God behind the recording. mystery voice. The little mystery Irish leprechaun voice. Mm -hmm. Just to get that one out of the way, she's Irish. That's the accent you're hearing. Yeah. So I've been getting a lot of requests to do a Q&A with my mom, so mm -hmm. you guys can ask her questions about what it was like raising me and stuff like that, any advice for parents who are raising kids with disabilities, that kind of thing. So we're changing it up today and that's what we're doing over on my Twitter at Molly B Official. I asked you guys to ask my mom questions. I think I just watched your boob. <laughs> Yeah, that's okay, Molly. <laughs> Blind girl problems. Good job. It's all good. And then over on my Patreon, I asked you guys to ask me questions. So most of the questions we pulled were from Patreon. We are going to ask a few from Twitter as well. Okay, so this question gets asked all the time. Mm -hmm. Some people don't even know like if Neve is a pet name or if it's like a made up word. So Neve is my mom's name. Mm -hmm. It's pronounced N-E-V-E, -E, like rhymes with Steve, mm -hmm. Neve. But it's spelled N-I-A-M-H. It's Gaelic. And I call my mom, Mom, Mama B, Neve, Nevi, Neum, which is kind of the phonetic pronunciation of Neve. And people always want to know why I call my mom by her first name. And it's kind of just a family thing. It's just a family thing. I mean, my brother for years, since he was a teenager, used to call my mom Pat, because her name is Pat. And it wasn't mom. I always called my mother mom. I think nobody minded it was it was his thing it was kind of cute i actually like when molly calls me need because we're in a working relationship you know it's like we call mom all the time and and i don't hear mom always but if she says need i can focus that's kind of so, why i started doing yeah. it she would kind of like tune out mom i do a lot but of that. Neve, she would always <laughs> listen to there's a lot of tuning out <laughs> thanks mom Love it's almost too. like reversal of the child who needs to have their attention like focused and that's the situation Molly is in, so she's she's developed all these. I will like go me. out to the couch at like almost midnight, and I'm like, Neve, put TikTok down. Yeah, you need to go to bed because we have to get up for a meeting. And she's like, Molly. So, <laughs> you know, our relationship is just different. But so like, I I started calling my dad Pierre or Peter since when I was like 14. I've called my mom Neve for years. My brother calls my grandma Pat instead of Nana. Like I call her Nana, but my brother calls her Pat. Like my mom said, my mom's brothers call their mom, who is. Pat, you know, you, you know, I, I think we just always liked a kind of a relaxed even situation. Like, even my aunt, her name's Lynn, and her kids both call her Lynn. Lynn yeah. They don't call her mom. It's kind of just like a weird family yeah, thing I mean, that spans yeah. generations and spans to both my dad's side of our family and my mom's side of the family, funny enough, both do it. So. I, I think we're all just super comfortable as we're all kind of, of friends. Family, children of the family and parents, like, we're just kind of friends. We just get together and especially as the children got older, the formalities kind of went you know we just wanted to have you know a fun relationship because life was stressful enough you know so why not kind of change it up a bit I remember some of your friends would come in and go this is, you're always having fun in your house you know we we're always just having fun and joking and getting away from the the seriousness of life and all the issues we had so I think that was one way of keeping things just very relaxed this is one of the things that I always say when when people ask about parenting like how my parents parented my brother and I and I know this is like one of those things that's really controversial they did actually always parent us more as friends they treated us like we should be adults that understood and they treated us like we were mature they never like babied us they never treated us like little kids and it really worked for us it really 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 worked for my brother and I that does not work in all parenting situations but in our case my parents treating us more as friends than parent child was really the right move for us, mm -hmm. for our family in particular. But yeah, it's it's just kind of like our family thing. We call each other by first names. And lots and of nicknames. Like lots of nicknames. All sorts of nicknames growing up. Molly Kabali, Malls. Molly Walls. Yalum. Molly Dolly, Yalum. We've all always had like lots of nick pet names for each other. And also like my parents were never the parents. Like when, when friends would come over, it was never Mr. and Mrs. Burke. Like it was Neve and Peter. We were always yeah, look at them and say, who, who are those people? <laughs> 
Mr. and Mrs. Burke. Let me, I'll just go find them. Okay. <laughs> when my boyfriend, like, FaceTimed my dad in Toronto for the first time, he said Mr. Burke, and we were all like, oh, God, no, 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 who's that? No, we don't know him. <laughs> Let's go get your father. <laughs> Peter, Peter. So, yeah, it's just, that's just how we are as a fam, so. Anyways, without further ado, we'll get into the official questions. The nitty gritties. Mm -hmm. The nitty gritties. Can we just do this? Why are you going to ask me Yeah, I'm going to ask you the question. This will be edited out. This money thing, you wish that you can do for me. Okay, like, why are you whispering it to me? It's, it's like I said, all like... edited out. Oh, yes. Let's see. Sorry, it's a pen down so look here. This will be edited out anyways. What is currently the hardest part about me being blind? Everything. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Everything's great. So the, the hardest thing currently is I've been begging Molly to wear slippers because Number one, she stubs her toe. Number two, Gal drools all over the floors. It's disgusting. Not all the time, but enough that like I walk in puddles if I don't have sandals on, shoes on, something on. And I, all I ask is Molly just wears her slippers or something and she doesn't. And then she's like, oh God, that's gross or whatever. I'm like, right. And every time I stub my toe, stubs her toe, she acts like I've been stabbed. And like, then I, I'm just laughing. I'm just like, good, good. Yeah. Now, does that hurt? <laughs> because maybe next time you'll wear those slippers I got you. Yeah, she's and too specific, Gallop got you yeah, slippers. Gallop bought me slippers for Mother's Day, so I'll wear slippers. Mm -hmm. What is one thing you wish you had done with me before I went blind? Absolutely nothing. We did everything. <laughs> we went right through the list. And Molly had long, long, long lists, and we just went like scratch, scratch, scratch. Skiing, dance, singing, acting. What else was it? Basketball, soccer, tennis, figure tennis, skating, tennis gymnastics. And all the Molly wanted to play tennis because her brother was playing tennis and it was a nightmare. But we got through that. She went close to the net. She missed 98% of the time. 98 balls out of 100. She drove the other kids crazy at the camp because they were like, what's she doing? She's too close to the net. She has an unfair advantage. Like, it was just a Little nightmare. did they know my unfair well, Molly advantage. Molly stood there with her racket and she did it anyway. It was amazing. <laughs> and literally, the coach on the other side of the net would like throw the ball directly to my racket like they would like line their throw up with my racket to make sure and then they go swing and swing can you imagine seven year old children trying to understand what's going on like it's really tough on them anyway yeah play tennis it was good got her own tennis racket it was all good my parents literally like any activity that i showed remote interest in they made sure to put me in whether it was like pottery acting drum lessons piano swimming like whatever it was they they put me in at least for one season so I could have that experience so I really did it all yeah horse riding I mean there was the list is like absurd like if we wrote yeah. down all of the activities I at one point in childhood was signed up to do and it was all because like I just really 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 wanted to try everything it wasn't a because I knew I was gonna go blind I want to try everything it was just like that's who I am as a person I still to this day I'm like I hear about mermaid swimming I want a damn tail and I want to jump in a pool like I just hear about things and I'm like I need to try that I want to go I grew up walking. I want to jump out of an can, airplane. You can still do all the things. Like it, it, it doesn't have to stop the list because as Molly continues on, she just keeps trying things. So there's no need to really feel that yeah. there's an end of a time to get everything done. Which, exactly, which I think is yeah. an important point because I do see a lot of people talking about the like before I go blind bucket list, which is good. It, it's like it's good, but it. it's not. Like it's good in the sense of like if there's certain like visual things that you want to see, then yes, like you do need to do those things. But I think the negative of that idea is that you can't continue to do great things after you go blind mm -hmm. because it's like I continue it's actually I, even more interesting and challenging isn't it yeah you just you just do it in different ways like no I can't go and see a painting or I can't go and see but it can be described but it can I can have other ways to experience things and I can still do just as much and have just as a fulfilling life and enjoy different activities just as much after going blind so I, I say even more so in many ways mm -hmm. you know very interesting though the whole adventure I call it <laughs> Especially with Molly. Very interesting. So this next question is a little bit more hard-hitting. They want to know how you coped with your emotions when I was diagnosed when I was four and then when I went blind when I was 14. So to be honest, I didn't deal with my emotions. I, I was just so wrapped up in raising two children. We renovated a house. It was very crazy. I worked part-time as well in photography, had my own business, so I had no time. So what would happen was I'd go to bed and then I would 
dream and I'd have this dream all the time the same dream I'd see Molly with a little cane running around I can remember the dress I can remember everything and I remember saying it to my mother-in-law one day I said why do I have this reoccurring dream and she said you're in shock and you're grieving <laughs> and I said how long does it go on like and she said It'll take a while, maybe five years. I, I looked up some, you know, kind of different statistics and it gave me a ballpark of around five years. So and I was timing it going, oh, you know, that's probably in around the time Molly's vision will get worse. She'll need support. I, sh I should, yeah, just let this happen. What I do regret and what I would advise to other parents is find your own outlets it's super important so that you can bring energy back to your family and to the child who's going through so much and to your other child who's even probably going through more and your, your relationship with your husband one thing we did do was we did have a lot of friends and we did socialize or be social a lot so that was a nice form of relief and very often our children were involved in those groups you know of parties and different things that we did so that really helped but um just having hobbies like I, I started yoga and I started seeing a nutritionist well, you started doing all of that after I went blind when yes. I was on my recovery yes. journey you kind of joined in on that yes actually that would be right that, that was the the point when I started doing those things it's like almost like once she started getting me help for my recovery she realized that those things might also help her in her own emotional mm -hmm. recovery as well yeah it worked out really well that way and that's um, part of what like we were always support groups um, I joined support groups right away. I joined every support group out there for parents of blind children. We have Molly join all different camps for blind children. We just... You really immersed yourself and me in the community. Yeah, we immersed ourselves in the most important kind of different... And we did a lot of fundraising, which really was therapeutic too. It was super therapeutic and super therapeutic for her brother and for Molly. And I can't emphasize that enough, that, that doing good, like it really, really... It takes helps. it off of you. It takes it off of you. It, it gives you like, it gives you like a focus that isn't your own self and your own grief yeah but I do think we were always very close but I think the fact that we almost went on the recovery journey together and that you joined in on a lot of the different things that I was doing in my recovery bonded us even further because it was like you and I were in the recovery together yes it really really helped one of the questions I saw on Twitter that I thought was interesting is what was the difference between raising me versus raising my sighted older brother well one's a boy one's a girl one's older one's younger then Molly was both very 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 busy children the eldest child child really had to be very luckily was very independent and had to be even more independent so he wasn't a lot of work we were just very lucky and we got him counseling right away because we were told he would be more affected than molly or us so it was the most important person to actually focus on was Brady. So we did get counseling for him. I don't know if we got enough counseling for him. And we kept him super busy in all his activities as well because he loved, he was like Molly, loved everything. So the two of them were like just crazy schedules on the go. Lots of his friends in, you know, to play with or whatever. And we put him in a, a school where we knew he'd be kept super busy. So his life was super full of all the things he loved to do. And that was that was huge, just finding the right spot for him. But I, I still feel it was tough because I, I never felt we could give him the same sort of attention that we had to give Molly. So one of the other ones that I thought was interesting was what was your first impression of Gypsy and what was your first impression of Gallop? And then overall, like, how did you feel when I said I wanted to get a guide dog and that whole process? So when Molly wanted to get a guide dog, we were actually super happy. You know, we thought that was great. We actually probably encouraged it. We thought it would be very nice for Molly to have the support of a, an animal, extra love, extra support. And we felt it was like, a, cause she was very sociable. We thought it was a nice kind of friendly approach to meeting people on the street or anywhere, new friends. And then when we, when Molly told us from the school about Gypsy, I think one of the things I said to her before she left was, now get a nice little dog, you know, like a small dog not a big dog and she was like yeah 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 sure and then I, I didn't really realize what the whole process was and then she phones me one evening and I'm running around making dinner stove is on actually there's a, a, a frying pan with hot oil on the stove and then Molly's telling me all about this dog she's, it, she's really big and she's so cute and loving and I'm going I screamed all she hears is like, the word big big I'm like no 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 
honey, no, I, I no, no. Remember we talked about no big dogs, and then and then the, the frying pan was going on fire in the kitchen. I looked around and went, oh my god, hold on a second. I ran and took the frying pan off with the flames, and, and she I threw like, it on the patio. And it's like this is a bad omen. This is a pretty really bad omen. I was like, Molly, I I really think you really should change your mind. Maybe go back. Could you ask them for a smaller dog? And she was like, nope. no, no, mom, <laughs> like no, this is a really nice dog. And I'm like. Oh, God, no. So you but know, but then you met her. Then I met you her. Came to visit. Yes. The family came to visit me while I was in training. She was adorable. She was so cute. She was lovely. She she watched Molly's brother eat popcorn, and she her face every would time. Go up and down. It's yes. So, cute. so it's like my, when my brother would put his hand in the bag, her face would like go down to the bag, and then he'd chew it, and her mouth would like chew along with his chewing. So she'd be like. Adorable. So cute. I mean, how can you not fall in love with a, a little doggy like that or a big dog? And then I got Gallop, who's even bigger. Now, Molly was having issues with getting Gallop. So we were going away for a little weekend. Her dad and I were all packed up and excited to go. And then we got a phone call. And that was Molly. This was half an hour before we left. So Molly's having this really tough time, you know, when she phones and she's crying and her eyes and I'm like, Ugh! What's wrong? And she says, I don't think this is going to work out. I think I'm going to come home this weekend. I, I, I know I can't find a dog I like. And this is one dog I'm working with. And I don't think it's going to work out. He's so slow. And blah, blah, blah. It'd be great. Which is don't true. Let him, don't let him hear. So he is slow. I was like, oh, okay. Don't worry. We'll cancel our plans. We'll, we'll drive. We'll come and get you. Don't worry at all. And then within half an hour, I think he phoned. Or an hour. Like we were like unpacking. And then Molly phones and goes, you know what? I, I'm going to give him a second chance I, I didn't realize the story behind it here i did this video up here on the story so you can click that which is actually a great time to remind you because that video i launched my guide dog merch collection the guide dog merch collection the hat is sold out but there's still four pieces left and the collection is limited edition so all of the four pieces that are left are going to be gone as of sometime in the next few weeks we've so far raised ten thousand dollars for mm -hmm. the mira foundation to empower other blind people to get guide dogs which is amazing thank you for all the support on this collection 100 percent of sales are being donated so so get your guide dog merch collection pieces before they're gone and help empower other blind people. Okay, go on. Awesome. So then Molly, she started saying, no, 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 maybe I'll just give them the weekend. So we thought, okay, great, we can go away for the weekend. Okay. So we hopped in the car before she changed her mind and left. And then a few hours later, later, I think you sent me a photograph. Yes. The next day she sent me a photograph. So I looked at the photograph and there was this huge dog and Molly and I just went, he's awesome like there was just something you just jumped out of this photograph and i just fell in love with him right away i just there was something about his energy in the photograph which is funny because he is the hardest dog to take photos of but yeah. i feel like i need to just say this oh yeah everybody's wondering why lavender has an instagram and gallop doesn't and wants us to start a gallop one people have wanted us to start a gallop one since i got him or since, well no because when i got him i didn't even have instagram for myself but yeah. people have always wanted a gallop instagram we're never gonna make a gallop instagram mm -hmm. i'm sorry he literally when i got him he was afraid of tripods and cameras like the guide dog school literally had to train him out of a fear of cameras and tripods that's like it's which is love. so ridiculous yeah. but that's how like he really hates cameras he's he's so hard to take photos of he hates getting his photos taken so there's no point like it's not fair on him to no. start an instagram for him when he like clearly so much hates taking photos so yeah poor guy so it's funny that we actually got a good photo of him that i sent you and you yeah you liked him so i absolutely loved her and i said molly if you like him just bring him back like he's he just looks great to this and day it's her favorite dog of all time yeah he's a a really special dog. He's 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 just incredible. He's so good. All right. Next, did you or anybody else in the family learn Braille? Mm, quite a story. So you now realize Molly has to help me focus a lot. <laughs> so in the middle of all this crazy schedule, people were suggesting I learn Braille, and it was crazy. Like the schedule was unrelenting, super busy all the time. Her dad had a really very demanding job as well. Um, so I thought, okay, maybe I should just learn Braille. So I went to far away to this course to learn Braille and had a very hard time keeping up and focusing. I was like, really, what am I going to do with this? Am I going to send Molly letters? For okay. <laughs> <laughs> all your own daughter letters? <laughs> what am I doing this for? I just left my family for a whole weekend. Molly said all this homework, like her dad, like it's a lot. So I got through it barely knowing I was going to fail and I had to go back the next weekend to do a test and I was just like, Okay, so I went back and I got lost. <laughs> 
I just got lost. It was a big long highway and I thought I knew where to get off the highway. And Keep in mind there was no like Google Maps back then. This was right. back when you had to literally like print out a piece of paper with directions. Yeah and I, I don't think I bought the piece of paper because again like it's just always so so busy. So I got lost. So I, I missed I missed the exam happily. <laughs> she would have failed. So I figured that was a sign that there was She was not meant to better learn that I, I didn't learn Braille and my mother just got through quite fine without me. Yeah. My Braille. I don't know what help it would have been for you to know Braille, to be honest. I think cups of coffee with Molly were more important than me Braille in her notes, to be honest. You know, I, I mean, it's a beautiful language and I'm thrilled and we thoroughly encouraged Molly to learn Braille. And, and I fought yeah. back hard. And she did, but we managed. And now we got all the colorful paper. Always saying everyone needs to learn Braille. Yeah, we made it fun. She entered different competitions. Didn't you for yes, Braille. I won Braille competitions. No big deal. No big deal. Yeah. No, it was, uh, it was good. And to this day, Super happy to have those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have two more questions. You guys sent so many questions. Like, I think we got 250 questions between Patreon and Twitter. We so, could do a whole series. <laughs> I was gonna say, if you do want another video like this, comment below, give this video a thumbs up, let us know that you wanna see another interview like this with my mom, and I can totally do that. I'm definitely down to do one with my dad next time, if we ever get to see him again. So <laughs> sad, not being able to travel. So I'm gonna do a hard hitting question, and then I'm gonna end on a lighter one. Oh, so, for me, like, I won't know what it is? No, I'm just. Don't panic. She likes to prep ahead of time. I I'm the one. I like to sit down with zero prep because it's more authentic. She likes to like have her prep time. Go ahead. Okay, so this was a big question I saw a lot of people asking, which is why I want to make sure to ask it. And that is how, given that I've dealt with a lot of mental illness, depression, suicidal ideation, and anxiety, how did you deal with that or support me through my mental health journey? Okay, number one, first thing off, I got a professional to help Molly because I really, I'm not a professional, so I, I don't know. So I searched high and low and very, very fortunately had somebody respond almost right away who had experienced a, a difficulty in vision, do you remember? Mm -hmm. So She had iritis, yeah, so iritis. she would like lose vision at certain points in her life. And even when you were younger, we got somebody in too. Yes, I had a blind a, yeah. psychologist yeah. as well. So just like with everything, if there was something to be learned, I kind of always got somebody else to teach them because I, I just thought it was a little too much trying to teach them and support them and do everything. So we got a wonderful, found a wonderful psychologist. And then what else? Just kind of went by her advice and then just super supportive Molly, like just kicked in tons of extra time, did tons of one-on-one -on -one with her really kind of put her own lives aside and her own relationship really in marriage and just devoted our time to supporting Molly through her tough times. And the thing is, it's, it's different for both, right? Because I dealt with depression and suicidal ideation at 14 and I dealt with anxiety at 20. So they were different periods in my life mm -hmm. and both needed different things. Yes. Like anxiety and depression are incredibly different experiences. I think with my depression, what you guys did really well is like knowing when I just needed to be alone. Mm -hmm. Like Yes, um, you tell us you would. That I just yeah. needed my own space to grieve and process. But then also like once I was suicidal, Suicidal, like really stepping in and making sure that mm -hmm. I wasn't alone and yeah. that, you know. Even at night, Molly would come in and sleep with us in our room. For a while she was in this big closet we had, we had a mattress in there. And then if she needed to be closer, she'd come closer to our right beside our bed on the floor and this mattress. They had like a walk-in closet to be clear. They didn't like shove me in a little closet. Yeah. They had a really big closet she in liked, my room. Molly loved the closet. I liked the closet. Yeah. I was surrounded by clothes. It was my happy place. It was really kind of <laughs> cozy and comfy. It was like very... Yeah cozy so I'd put a mattress on the floor in their closet and close the door so I was like in their room with them but I had my own little space yeah so just tons of support and then just doing even more fundraising you know well, like just doing things that were fun like you joyful. would take me to like look at yeah. makeup or take me out for lunch or like Lots because I you know I had no friends so my mom just like became, became my best, best friends. friends yeah to be honest we were very isolated together like Molly and I became isolated you know and that's that's an important question too about like what was my one fear? Yeah, there was one question that like, what was my mom's biggest fear when I was diagnosed? And if I can say one word, one word I would go to bed with, one word I would wake up during the night with, one word I have worked constantly on through the years is if you brought it all down to one word, it's isolation. That was my fear for Molly was that she will be isolated in her life. And so it was always like trying to figure out how do we help her not be isolated? So that that's the one word that we really worked on. And I think we So we just sure became that, isolated together. Yeah, we became isolated together. And, and that was fine. So yeah, and, and then by coming to LA really, it broke that whole cycle mm -hmm. for us. Like it really, 
broke the cycle. Started a new a new, new life. chapter, a whole new life. Yeah. And we were on the road a lot together too. So between the work and then the, the social aspect of things, we just got increasingly isolated over the years. Yeah. But yeah, they, but we, we, we worked really hard at and now I would think you're not isolated at all really. Because no. you're always busy and out and about and lots of friends and yeah. All right, we're gonna wrap this up with a positive question. What is the best thing about having a blind child and what has it taught you about the disability community? I love this question because you guys know I love making content like this video right here, mm -hmm. where I do like 10 best things about being blind and stuff like that and really flip the conversation of disability over because mm -hmm. it's so often talked about in negative ways. So I think it's fun to end on like the positive side of it. Yes, I think um, the best thing has been maybe embracing the situation and just living within this confined situation that we kind of lived in with the isolation and everything and then just realizing that you can find all this joy within it even though it's really really hard and just finding solutions to still make your day a great day you know or a good day or making the next day a good day to get over the bad day so just having to think super cre creative creatively Thank you, Mom. Creatively <laughs> has been fantastic. Like it, it's it's just expanded my brain. It's like you're learning a new language. So I love the challenge of that. Like, and I think Molly does. Well, I, I think it's yeah. also like the reason we are so close as mother and daughter, and mm -hmm. the reason our family is so close and tight knit is because of my blindness. Yes. We would not have been forced to spend so much time together and do so much together if it was not for my blindness. Yes. And I think it's brought such a huge blessing to us. I, it's hard to describe. My dad it. always jokes that blindness was the best thing that ever <laughs> happened to this family, so. Yeah, like it, it just, we learned how to flip the challenge into a positive. We learned how to climb walls really fast, leap over the walls that we were presented with instead of like <gasps> sitting down and panicking and like, oh my God, what was us? Like, what are we gonna do? Like, I'm just picturing us as little <laughs> cartoon characters in like a video game running up the wall and leaping yeah, over. Yeah, it was literally like that. Like we just, <laughs> we, we learned to get strong. We learned to, to find more joy. Like it challenged us so much. And I, I just, it was quite wonderful. And, and the disabled community. Yeah, what has it taught you about the disabled There's community? There's so many wonderful people out there there that are supportive of the disabled community who you meet the best people in the world and I, I, I can't emphasize that enough you also like, meet the worst but you, you meet the, the worst best. as well but like if you focus on the best like you've won you know there's definitely um huge challenges even other people who are blind understanding molly is still a challenge you know it, it just it is and we're figuring ways around that but um you meet the best we've lived an incredible incredible life. I think by embracing the situation and, and finding the best, we've opened ourselves up to this wonderful life. It's been quite wonderful despite yes. all those challenges. All right, I think we've talked enough, so that's a good place to just close it off. Come on. Because she's saying she can't talk enough about it, so I'm going to cut you <laughs> off and say, yes, you can. We're done. Let me know again, like I said, if you want me to do another video like this, because we certainly can. Keep um, talking. Yes. We always can keep talking. Just now you know why I talk so much. <laughs> I have this in my life. My dad's the same too. Or my, 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 my. Jeez, daddy. I remember when my ex-boyfriend met my extended family, he was like, ah, oh, <laughs> I understand you so much more now why you never stop talking. It's the whole family. So yeah, I hope you guys had fun just listening to us ramble and be mother and daughter together. Click up here if you want to see five facts you didn't know about blindness and click up here if you want to see five ways you can help make the world more accessible. All right. Love you guys and I'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Bye.